somebody's got a scar in the middle of their motor cortex, and if we remove that, then they're going to have a problem with motor movement from that part of the brain. Uh, I was just wondering, what is it, I would say, Robin's one has with myasthenia gravis? Myasthenia gravis. Myasthenia gravis is a neurology disease. Uh, it has to do with... Uh, so it's not something that's like in the brain? It has with brain physiology, and it's like Parkinson's, myasthenia, um, Alzheimer's in a way, so myasthenia and um, Parkinson's have to do with either too much or not, usually not enough of brain transmitters. How's your turn? Um, okay. I don't know if you know this, but like, among short-term memory patients, what's like the, what's like the shortest <laughs> amount of time there are can have a memory, like for short-term memory? Yes, yes. Well, I'll tell you a story. Once upon a time, a long time ago, probably 20 some years ago, I took out a very big brain tumor in the center of a young woman's brain. And she did really, really well. I went to see her the next morning in the ICU. I said, Good morning, how are you feeling? She says, I'm fine. How was my surgery? I said, Doing really well. Moving her arms, moving her legs. Asked her to name some objects, repeat some words, checked her vision. She was great. It's great. I was better than I thought. I go sit down and hear her say, Dr. Kanoff. I said, yeah. She said, when am I having my surgery? So the time it took me to walk out. She had no short-term memory at all. Zero. It wasn't such a good operation. Right? But anyway, um, there are things, there are places in the brain where you can go with relative impunity. There are places in the brain where you have to be somewhat circumspect. The places in the brain that you probably shouldn't go, unless you absolutely have to, and then the things in the brain that you just can't touch. And there's a part of the brain called the fornix, there's one on each side, very deep in the medial frontal lobe, right in front of where the pituitary is, and you can't see it as an isolated structure. If you damage the fornix on one side, not a big deal. But if you damage both of them, no memory. And as far as we knew, from our brain mapping, we weren't really anywhere near either column of the fornix, but she had no short-term memory. Um, and I see her once a year, as 20 years later, and she's learned to write, she's learned to adapt by writing notes for herself, but she has zero short-term memory. It's like the coolest operation. <laughs> the coolest operation I've ever done. Okay. The most difficult operation I had to do was when I was, uh, it was, I was in San, the University of California, San Diego, as chief resident. And then we talked about the basilar artery that comes up the brain stem. We had a patient who had a split in the artery. It came up, split, and reconstituted. And right where it split, the patient had a six millimeter bubble, an aneurysm, that had bled. So we had to go and we had to fix that. And the operation took place through a corridor about four millimeters wide, uh, that far back into the brain. Um, probably my favorite. I've had a bit one operation of which I'm most proud because of the outcome. A 33-year-old guy, I can see him, I know his name. And actually, I can see the patient, and I know the name of the patient. It was the first time I ever saw an operation in a surgery. So I'm not quite demented yet. Um, I like doing aneurysm surgery. It's difficult, it's extremely challenging, and it's extraordinarily not forgiving. Because the aneurysm rupture in the operating room, it is not uncommon for patients to die. Um, so you kind of have to, I tell my residents, you have to be perfect when you start the residency program and just keep getting better and be extremely lucky. Um, so I guess that's, to me, that's the most complicated operation, most technically demanding operation. I like taking out tumors. I, mean, I don't want people to have tumors, but if they're going to have them, and they come to me, I like taking out tumors. It can be extremely rewarding. It also be very depressing. There's some things in the nervous system that people get that will have them dead in six months. So that's sort of the downside of things. Um, I, like, I, like, I like my experience as a pediatric neurosurgery, but I turned down my fellowship because I just couldn't. I couldn't. It's just too hard. You see a five-year-old with who walks in the clinic, and you know they've got a tumor. You know they'll be dead in a year, no matter what you do. I, I, I couldn't do that. So, that's that. So if you like, when you're doing brain surgery, obviously you have to get through the skull. Yep. So, like, how do you do that? Okay. So we take a scalpel blade, kind of like this one, and we make an incision in the skull. Usually, many times a straight line. Sometimes like an upside down U. And we peel the scalp back, 
And then we have, a, we have special instruments that are in, uh, electric or gas driven drills that have automatic stop zones. We make a couple of small holes to get through the skull and then take a saw and just to connect dots, lift out a piece of bone, which we usually go back, open the covering of the brain, and if somebody has a blood clot sitting on the surface, we'll be looking at it, we'll, we'll wash it out. Uh, if somebody has a tumor sitting on the surface of the brain, we'll dissect it away from the surrounding brain. We use fancy tools in the OR, like we have computer guidance, we have lasers, and all kinds of stuff. Um, and then when we're done, we uh, close the covering, put the bone back, sew the skin back together. The patient wakes up and is doing okay. Tumors deep in the brain are harder to deal with because they don't present with anything on the surface of the brain. A lot of times we'll do tumors that sit right on the surface of the brain. So when you open the covering, tumor's sitting right here. So it's easy to see where it starts and stops. The more malignant tumors in the brain that start in the brain, not the ones that spread to the brain, are diffusely infiltrating. And there is no start here, stop here. Um, you know where the bulk of the tumor is, but you also know, as a surgeon, that five or six centimeters away from where the MRI says the tumor stops, there are probably tumor cells infiltrating into the brain. You also know you can't go that far without damaging the patient. And you've got to find, without any external landmarks to guide you, where you think the tumor is. Now, up until about 15 years ago, that was based on a lot of science and a lot of study and a lot of preoperative planning. Now we have computers where we put little marks on the patient's head ahead of time, map out the computer, and we have a little wand that tells us on the computer screen where we are relative to the tumor. It takes a lot of the guesswork out of where to look for these deep tumors, uh, makes surgery much, much safer for the patient. And I would not suggest going away from that, um, except to note that over the years, the years have gone by, my residents have become much more technology dependent. They think a little bit less because the computer, well, because they do, because the MRIs will make the diagnosis for them. They think a little bit less critically about surgical planning because the computers do all the surgical planning. And we still have to do it, we have to do it properly, but a lot of time that we used to spend planning the right approach to this, that, and the other, the computer computer does for us. Basically, start here, go there, stop there, don't do that. Not that, it, not that it's any less challenging technically, but the, um, the thought process has been replaced a lot by computer guidance. And again, safer for the patient. Sure. How often do technical errors occur? Like oh, with the dependency on <laughs> well, and, oh, 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 that. Well, that's an interesting question because one of the problems with the neuronavigation computer system is that once we've opened the brain and once we start to take out the tumor, things move. And the computer guidance system can only tell you where you would have been if you hadn't taken out like half of the tumor. So if you're looking for the back end of the tumor or the front end or the medial end of the tumor, the computer guidance won't help you because it can show you where you would have been when you started. So sometimes before we take anything out, we'll go to the front, the back, the medial end, and we'll put a little marker. So we know when we get to the marker, we're done. Uh, sometimes you use MRI in the operating rooms as a bit cumbersome to see just how much tumor is left and where we have to go to get it. But again, it's, it's more technology. Uh, there are other things we do in our surgery where um, our computer guides might be off by, the, the companies that make these machines will warrant them up to one millimeter. One millimeter in the brain is probably good enough to be okay, but sometimes they'll be off three or four millimeters and immediately, my team and I have to recognize that this is not telling us where we really are, it's telling us where it thinks, it thinks we are, and we know better because we know what we see, and then we basically wheel that out of the room and go back to the old-fashioned way of trying to be uh, you know, clinical neurosurgeons in the operating room and not be so good in my technology. And that's the other thing, a lot of my junior residents, technology is so reliable that that's all you need, and occasionally, computer will crash, oh my god, what are we going to do? Now we've got to go back and want to think about what we're going to do. So you can't be so dependent that you forgot how to do it. Without. Any other questions? Yes? How long, I mean, how often have you had to turn down a patient because of whatever's happening is too difficult to fix? Like, how often does that happen? Um, let's see, I've been in practice now, I'm finishing 30 years 
I thought he'd be dead or retired by now, but <laughs> obviously neither. Uh, there, there are things, I don't do aneurysm surgery anymore, and I guess I can't, because the hospitals in which I'm currently working don't have enough interventional x-ray support to do the things after the surgery that might make a difference. So five year, four years ago, we decided we wouldn't do aneurysms anymore. Um, other than that, uh, I don't do peds. I, I, in, in a pinch, I could if I had to. Um, but there's very little, there's very little else that I see in my practice that I haven't done before. So occasionally, I'll see something really bizarre that I just don't feel comfortable taking care of. Um, but it doesn't happen often. But I, I teach my residents to recognize when you have to say you can. You know, I, I have nothing to prove anymore. I've done this long enough. And I teach them, in the beginning, you have to recognize when it's beyond your training, beyond your skill level, beyond your comfort level. It's different for everybody. There's nothing worse, I will tell you, this happened when I was a resident. There's nothing worse than biting off the case and maybe should we do it, should we ship it, should we do it, should we ship it. Then you're doing it in the middle of what you're saying, why didn't I send this case out? Because once you're in it, you're in it. And then, you know, the hell breaks loose. And it seemed like a good idea at the time. It doesn't really help with a bad result. What's the most bizarre case? Oh, okay. It's not a brain case. Can I tell you the most bizarre yes. case? Oh. Um, we sometimes see people who have abscesses which collection of infected material pus in the brain, which is really not good for the brain, and frequently around the spine. And there's a guy who we saw four years ago came in with a brain with a spine abscess, came with back pain, leg weakness, loser control of bowels and bladder. We did an MRI, it was huge abscess and infection. And I, you know, drug addicts get them, people in dialysis get abscesses because they get bacteria from their dialysis grass. So he said, you know, like anything unusual happened as well. I've been feeling over the last two weeks. And he said, I was, you know, fishing at the creek a couple weeks ago and it was time for my heroin, but I realized I didn't bring any, anything to mix the heroin. So I took some creek water, mixed my heroin with creek water, and injected it. Our, our infectious disease doctors had never seen most of the organisms we cultured out of his brain, out of spine um, we, had, we, had an, we had another lady who presented with a lesion about this big in the back of her head because her family noticed something wasn't smelling right. And this sort of had broken down and got infected. It must have been growing for 30 years, which always wore hair down in a bun. So nobody ever knew. And we did the, we did the, the casket before we had MRI. It looked like there were skeletal elements in it. We thought it was possibly a, um, a twin that formed when she was in utero that partially resorbed. I was really excited because there, there, there's a paper, there's an invitation of big international leading, so it doesn't happen very often. Uh, it turned out not to be that. It turned out to be something equally, equally rare, but not quite as, uh, not quite as sexy sounding. That was, that was interesting. It had, uh, it had blood vessels going through it the size of my phone. We also do brain surgery with people awake because the only pain fibers are in the skull. The brain, ha interesting of the brain has no pain fibers. So you can cut to the brain, it doesn't hurt. There are times when we need to do surgery with people awake because we're doing things like putting electrodes in to stimulate parts of the brain from tremors or for other things, or we're operating around uh, their speech cortex or the motor cortex, and we need to stimulate areas of the brain and ask them what they feel or do a weight mapping in the operating room. Uh, it's a little bit... I, I remember the, the first or second awake case I did was a young guy with a tumor. And we're talking to him. I said, now tell me where you feel this. So I feel it on my toe. Where do you feel it? And he says, is this as cool for you as it is for me? You're looking at my brain and I'm away talking to you? I said, yeah, that's pretty cool. <laughs> that's so, cool. That cool. so you could just touch parts and you'd be like... And they're just sitting there like... I don't know. Yeah, that's weird. That's, 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 we try not to think a whole lot. We think about the operation we're doing more than we think about the sort of uh, metaphysical ramifications of operating on somebody's brain. You have to respect what you're doing, respect the patient, do what you have to do, and separate. And once in a while, I'll step back and say, that's really cool. But, I, you know, not, even still, I mean, four years, of, four years of medical school, six years of training, and 30 years of practice, 
I still think this is, I can't imagine doing anything else. Uh, good luck to all of you though. Thank you for coming today. Hope you learned something. Hope you found it interesting. Yeah. And I took a look at the essay. It doesn't look so hard. <laughs>